Hi, I'm Eric Rock, and welcome to 2024. Yay! And to Worship Song Lyric Analysis, where we analyze worship songs both old and new, and try to figure out A, if there's any doubt or confusion at all, what do the words in the song mean, and much more importantly, B, are those words biblical? And today, we're looking at a newer song, Hope of the Ages, by Hillsong. So Hope of the Ages was written by Reuben Morgan and Cody Carnes, and the most famous version is Hillsong's featuring them. Morgan and Carnes have said in interviews that the whole song is based on the simple confessions that Jesus died, Jesus rose again, and Jesus is coming back, and how the church needs to hold on to that. How they believe that is the essence of the gospel, which is a hope for the church and all people, no matter what the changing times or craziness that we're living in. Which is a great and fundamental truth of Christianity, but we all know for how great the idea behind the song is, that's not what makes it biblical, it's in the execution. So without further ado, how biblical is Hope of the Ages? Let's jump on in. The song starts off in verse 1. The gospel of Jesus is the hope of the ages, burning brighter and brighter and standing forever. And yes, amen, I would like to say that yes, this is very biblical. The gospel of Jesus is the only hope for Christians and non-Christians, all of sinful humanity, forever and ever. But friends, I would like to go a little deeper because just to get honest with you here in 2024, I don't want to turn out video after video for the sake of creating content. I only want to make videos when I really do feel like God has something that he wants me to tell you. And, and as I was thinking about this song and praying about what God wanted me to say, I, I kept coming back to this idea of, okay, the gospel is, is the hope of the ages, but what is the gospel? And, and friends, that is a major question, right? What is the gospel? Well, if you've spent any time in Christianity or Christian circles, you probably know that gospel literally just means good news, right? That's the translation of the word from Greek and literally from Old English, gospel, good news. So what is this good news? Well, again, if you spent any time in Christianity, you probably know the standard line of, well, Jesus died and rose again. And yes, I do want to be clear, that is very good news and a good way of concisely stating what one of the main points of the gospel is, but I think to, to truly grasp the goodness, the greatness of the gospel, I think some clarification is needed. Let me explain. If you as a perfectly healthy person go to the hospital and the doctor says, good news, you don't have cancer. Well. Yeah, yes, that's obviously very good news and much better than the alternative. That would be very, very bad news if you did have cancer, but it is good news that is kind of expected as you're a healthy person with no health problems. And so it's good, but it's kind of expected. However, if you're a person literally dying of cancer who has been through all the treatments and, and the cancer just doesn't go away and you've resigned yourself to the fact that you're probably going to die because of this, but then all of a sudden the doctor comes up to you and says, well, good news, you don't have cancer. Well, that puts that good news into a whole nother light, right? You were basically dead. You would resign yourself to the fact that you had no hope. And then all of a sudden, they come with good news of hope. And so that puts the good news at a whole other level. And so that's why I would say that the good news can't be fully qualified and understood without the bad news that we are all sinners. And the Bible is very clear about this, right? We were dead in our sins. We were without hope before Christ came, lived a perfect life, died on the cross, and took our sin and debt and died for us, and then rose again and conquered death. And so that is, in essence, the gospel that we proclaim that is the hope of the 
ages. The song continues. The church he is building. Nothing can stop it. It's a city that's shining a light in the darkness. And yes, this is true. Matthew records a story for us where Jesus is talking to his disciples and he asks them, well, who do other people say that I am? And the disciples say, oh, maybe a, a reincarnation of John the Baptist or a prophet or something. But then Jesus says, well, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus responds, well, blessed are you, Peter, because Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but our Father in heaven. And you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Jesus is building his church, and nothing will stop it. Why? Because it's built on the rock. And there's been a lot of discussions about what rock means here because just a quick Greek lesson, the word Peter actually means rock is, is one of the words to mean rock in Greek. So when he says, you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church, some people have taken that to believe that he's building the church on Peter, which doesn't really make sense because Peter is just a man, but also because they're two different words in Greek. And some people try and skirt around this by saying, oh, well, Jesus probably spoke originally in Aramaic where the two words are the same. But, but friends, the word of God is inspired. So when the authors were writing it down, those words were inspired by the Holy Spirit. So the difference is inspired. And the difference is noteworthy. For instance, Charles John Ellicott says in his commentary, Petras Peter is a, a stone or a piece of a smaller rock, whereas Petra, rock that he will build the church on, represents more the rock as a whole, which the rock as a whole, and there is legitimate debate whether it's the confession that Jesus is the Son of God or Jesus himself, but for me, it's kind of two sides of the same coin. You know, the church is built on Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God. And so that's what the church is built on, and that's why nothing can stop it, and that's why this is a great lyric to sing. All right, so we've looked at what is the gospel and what is the church. Well, in the chorus, they answer the question, well, what is the message? Though Christ was dead, now surely he's risen. Yeah, he's coming back again, and Christ will reign in triumph forever. Yeah, all praise belongs to him. Yeah, all praise belongs to Jesus. And amen and amen. This is a great saying and a great thought. And again, as I said, the essence of the gospel that Jesus died, that Jesus was buried, and that Jesus rose again. I would give a detailed analysis, but I would like to let the Word of God speak for itself and summarize it with a passage from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. So was this given to generate controversies about the end times? No. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. That is an encouragement. Christ died and was buried, and thus, whether we are dead or alive, when Jesus comes back again, we will always be with the Lord. And that, friends, is the ultimate goal of the gospel, what we are working towards. And remembering that goal is what can help us along the journey when everything seems bleak and dark and we have no hope. Jesus is the hope. Amen. All right, in the next verse they say, his word is the answer for all generations. It will never be tainted. It will never be broken. This is our confession. This is our conviction. We believe what you've written. We believe what you've spoken. And 
Amen and amen. So the final question, what is the word? And as scripture tells us itself, all scripture is inspired by God and useful for teaching, reproof, correcting, and training in righteousness. Every word of God is the answer. You can't pick and choose what words you like and what words you don't like. His word is flawless and what we need to build our faith and trust and hope in God in. If we say, oh, we hope in Jesus, but we don't hope in God's word, well, we've basically just made a Jesus of our own liking. We need to follow God's word. We need to meditate on it. We need to love it as the psalmist. And with how great God is, is it any wonder that the song ends on sing hallelujah, Christ is our redeemer. Amen and amen. All right, and that was Hope of the Ages by Hillsong. Is it biblical? Yes, I truly believe that it is biblical and it is a really good song. I think that it's okay if songs focus on parts of the gospel and Jesus dying and rising and reigning is a great part to focus on and I think that it's something that's worth remembering as believers. And friends, I do pray that you would remember that today and that you would walk in this year of 2024 as every year in the grace, knowledge, and peace of God. Until next time, friends, peace.